thank you for having me, first of all. It's, a, it's an honor to be here, and uh, I'm excited to, to do this. Um, I looked up some of the other you know, conversations that you've had, and uh, this is very cool for me to, to get to do this. Thank you. Um, it starts uh, you know, when I'm a kid. Um, I needed a job, and I was 14 years old. I grew up in, uh, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, when I went to high school, my parents, we moved to Somerville, New Jersey, and that's where I went to high school. And, and to clarify, Brooklyn yeah. was very different back then than it is now, right? Yeah, Brooklyn, <laughs> Brooklyn. you know, the, the cool parts of Brooklyn today were parts you weren't allowed to go to when I was a kid. Right. You, you were shot and killed, yeah. basically. Um, and now they're all really, you know, high-end, sure. super cool uh, places. But um, my dad was an attorney, and he was uh, the kind of guy who just believed in hard work and good ethics and good morals. and. Uh, you got to work for what you, you want. And so there was a stereo that I coveted, and uh, I wanted him to buy it for me. And he said, well, I'll pay for half of it. And I'm 14, you know, I'm making, you know, <laughs> no money. And uh, my allowance was just barely covering lunch, right. you know. So, um, so he said, you should get a job. And I was 14, and I, I, I lied about my first, uh, for, to get my first job. I told him I was 16 so I could work extra hours. And I was a dishwasher. And uh, as much as it was, hard work, hot, sweaty, gross work. I loved it. There was a connection to the guest, and there was this interaction between the staff that just called me, and I just loved it. And um, I worked in that restaurant all through high school, and they allowed me, I remember, I'll, I'll never forget, the, the bartenders were like old school bartenders. They, they said, in order to be a good bartender, you have to read two newspapers a day so you can talk about sports and politics and <laughs> the stock market, and you could have a little something to say about a lot of different things. And at the end of the night, when I was closing up, they'd be sitting there counting their you know, piles of money, and they'd say, hey, Michael, do you want to get behind the bar and pour us a beer? And I just thought it was the greatest honor to pour the bartenders their, yeah. their beer at the end of the night while I was putting glasses and whatnot away. And that was sort of the start of like, just being interested. And I always, uh, I always was interested in cooking, even as a, as a kid. I was a, a jock who you know, played all sports, but I also loved cooking. My, my mother and my grandmother, Great cooks, and uh, the kitchen was a very central part of the house for sure. So I was gonna, I was yeah. gonna ask you. A, sorry to interrupt. I was yeah. gonna ask you the name of that first restaurant if you recalled it. Of but course, I remember. Yeah. Well, they hired a 14-year-old, and they were also letting you serve them beer. So maybe we should leave that off the record. No, it's not there anymore. So they can't <laughs> okay. get in that much. So they throw it out there. It's called the newsroom. <laughs> the and, newsroom. Uh, oh, very, and, yeah, very appropriate. It's called it. the newsroom, and it was the precursor to what Cheers was, sort of. Like, yeah. you walked in, and everybody didn't know your name, and they knew what you drank. And you know, if you, once I got old enough to drink, you, know, you walked in there, and that whatever you liked was sort of sitting at your seat before you ever got there. It was a special place, and that's what sort of like got me going. And um, I, I kept in touch with the ownership there forever. Uh, the owner was the one that helped me get into culinary school, and I decided that's what I wanted to do. Well, you had mentioned, too, so um you were a jock uh, who was also interested in food, and, and, and I believe maybe you're right at this, this kind of fork in the road, uh, but you had the opportunity to go on and play baseball, right? And well, you I made played, a decision yeah. to, to I, Well, come. the decision was made for me. Yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> um, I, I, was, I was a very good uh, athlete, but um, I got hurt also. So I went to college, and I played ball in, in school, and, sure. and uh, the, but I got hurt, and I, you know, this, the Listen, there's a million people that have a similar story to me where they, they did decently as a high school or college athlete and got hurt and couldn't play any longer. And uh, so I actually did, the funny thing is that the culinary school that I went to, um, called the Academy of Culinary Arts, you were allowed to take, or you're not allowed, you had to take uh, extra classes in a local um, junior college. And you got all the sort of rights and privileges of if you wanted to be in a play or you wanted to do something. Sure. So I had gotten hurt, and I really couldn't pitch anymore. I was a pitcher, but I could still hit really well. So I, um, I went out for the baseball team at this <laughs> junior college. They're ringer. And they thought I was a joke because I was in the culinary school, and they never had anybody from the culinary school try out for a team before. And they would tease me and say things like, oh, what are you, in the Betty Crocker League, you know, when you're, I swear to God, so yes. or then they had the, uh, they would tease me and say, oh, in the summer you play in the Continental Breakfast League, and they would come up with all these names for me. And then I tried out and showed them that I was actually a really good <laughs> baseball player, and they wanted me on the team then. So, um, but, you know, it, 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 the, the whole thing is uh, when you're lucky enough to find that, that thing, that, that if you're going to, you know, work takes a lot of time out of our day, obviously, and when you find that thing that just clicks, and I hope people are lucky enough to find that one thing, 
Um, I didn't know what I wanted. My, my dad wanted me to be a lawyer with him. I didn't want to do that. Uh, I had other friends that said, you know, with the, the, the way that I just sort of behaved and whatnot, that I should maybe go into finance and economics. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something that was creative. And, um, you know, what I love about my job is that it encompasses everything. It's, it's art, it's history, it's geography. You're a cheerleader, you're a psychiatrist, you have to be a business person. Um, you get to be an artist uh, as well. And, um, but you're, at the end of the day, you're taking care of people and you're teaching. Um, and that's, that's the part that really, once I got to a certain point in my career, that's the part that I think uh, sort of gets me up every day and makes it so exciting. And plus I get to deal with lots of different cuisines. So it's not like I'm only making hamburgers all day long. So sure. I get to play around with lots of different foods. Well, what was it for you? You talk about this idea of, of clicking. Mm. What was it for you that clicked? Obviously you were in culinary school. What was it for you that drove you to say, okay, I want to continue to pursue this and then ultimately, um, you started working, you, you toured, and you worked in a lot of different restaurants, some of the best restaurants around the country, mm -hmm. and then ultimately, you, and talk about that, please, sure. but also then what took you from, maybe the next click that took you from working in other people's restaurants to now your own. So that's, there's a, several questions in there. So the, the early part really we, is- We like multi-part yeah. questions here yeah. at Google. And so just to see if I'm yeah. paying attention yeah. also. If you forget any of the parts, I'll remind you. So at the, <laughs> well, the, the early part certainly was that at a very early age, I realized that girls thought it was cool that I liked to cook. I could not play the guitar. I really am not good with mechanics and stuff like that. But I, could, I can cook for you. And um, that's how it sort of started. I started cooking for, for girls I was interested in. And they thought that that <laughs> it's was good. a good reason as any, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, it's funny, I recently ran into an old friend of mine, not somebody I dated. And she said, do you remember that you would come over in college and like make us omelets in the morning? I was like, yeah, I, was, I loved your, your roommate. You know, I wanted her to like me. So um, that was the start of it was, uh, I swear, that's the real reason. So that's, that's a great story for you. When yeah. I was in college, Michael Schlau would come over and cook us omelets. Exactly. You know? and, um, Not bad. And then, you know, but then there was something that, um, that's sort of unspoken. And you know, whatever it is you do, and when you find your passion in life, and you're lucky enough to realize that this is that moment where this is the thing I want to do, the light bulb goes off and you just think, what's the real definition of success? You know, is it how much money's in your wallet? I don't think so. It's are you getting to do something that you love every single day? And do you wake up energized every day to go and do this? Because I do work a lot of hours and my personal and my business life are really blended together. Mm -hmm. um, but it has um, been a fascinating life that's gotten, uh, given me the opportunity to travel around the world and meet some of my heroes and cook for them. And uh, my, one of my great passions in life other than cooking and uh, my family, obviously, is uh, I love music. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten to meet some of my heroes and ultimately become friends with some of them and travel with them. And I've just got, you know, I've had the most amazing experiences because of it. You know, as far as what you were asking about the, the restaurants and the cooking and, and sort of how it goes, some of it's just dumb luck also, you know. Um, <laughs> it is, sure. I mean, sometimes right. you're just in the right place at the right time and somebody doesn't show up and, you know, you think about that path and how, you know, you, you move forward and sometimes you think, ah, was this the right move for me? But then you look at sort of uh, the cataclysmic jumps of, of each thing that happens and it worked out for me, you know, that, it's been a bumpy road at times. I mean, it hasn't just been this beautiful, you know, line straight up. It's, there's lots of bumps in there and restaurant closings and a divorce and there's all kinds of stuff that, <laughs> that's happened. But, um, but that's what's life, you know, that's what makes it interesting. And then work hard and, and come out on the other side and, 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 and be successful. But, you know, I think the, the, the most, not the most, well, one of the most important takeaways is about good mentorship. Uh, I was yeah, lucky sure. enough to have really good mentors. They yelled and screamed at me, which I don't do to, to my staff, but it was a different time. I would have you know, food thrown at me or screamed at. Um, and, Any uh, knives pulled on you? Never a knife, okay. but I did. We've heard I, that before in, I, in our I, chef's ads. I never had a knife pulled <laughs> out, uh, but I have, I've had people throw things at me and you, know, you just want to say, you know, go fuck yourself. I'm not staying <laughs> here for this. You know, this is abusive. Right. And today's world is about, for me, I learned a long time ago that it's got to be about teaching and dedication and commitment and getting the people, the men and women that work with me, and they never work for me. That's the big difference also. And what I used to work for my chefs. The people that work with me work with me versus for me. And it's just a different approach as to how to be a good teacher. If you want to be a good leader, you've got to be a good teacher. And if you want to be a great leader, you have to be a great teacher. Why do you think that's changed? Because we've had a lot of chefs who come in here and they talk about 
chefs of old, like the Charlie Trotters, right, yeah. who used to scream and yell oh, yeah. and throw things. And uh, these chefs who would come in and practice under them and learn, they were terrified. And, and now the chefs that we have come in, the, the most recent ones we've had come talk as part of the series, it's more to what you're saying, it's, and, and it makes a lot of sense. Why do you think that was, first of all, why was it like that in the past? And, so, and I think we yeah. know why it changed. But. Well, I know why. They, I think I knew because I used to be a yeller and a screamer. Um, I, I, I came from that school, and so I did the same thing. Sure. And I used to have this internal message to myself. If, if I haven't made you cry yet, you probably haven't heard me. It was horrible. It's like, and it's no way to live. It's like, you're going to give yourself a heart attack. And there was this guy, I was working in New York City. I, I worked a good portion of my life in New York uh, before moving to Boston. And there was a guy who used to come in every single day for lunch by himself. And he was just, I think it was his only moment of peace. He would come and he'd, he'd eat lunch in this restaurant by himself. And one day I come out of the kitchen and um, I was all pissed off. One of the young cooks was not doing what I wanted him to do. And the guy's reading the newspapers. His name was George. I'll never forget him. And he, he said, uh, he would always say to me, I, I make decisions all day long. You make the decision about what I want to have for lunch today. I just, and he'll say, fish or chicken or whatever. And I'd go back and I'd cook him something. And so anyway, I come out one day and I said, how was your lunch, George? And he said, it was really delicious. Thank you. And he's like, what's the matter? You look upset. I was like, ah, oh, I don't even want to talk about it. I'm so pissed off right now. This kid, Shane, he's not doing what I want. And I start ranting. And I'm getting more and more worked up. And he said, uh, what is Shane's job here? And I said, well, he's a line cook. And I uh, start sort of just bitching about it. And he said, well, you're the chef, right? And I said, yep. He said, well, I don't know what you're so upset about. It, it's your fault. And this, I was young. I said, right. my fault? George, how could it be my fault? I told him what to do. And he said, well, you're going to learn this the hard way, I'm sure. And there's two ways. You really have two choices here. Either train him to do his job or deem him untrainable and let him go. But you can't let him go until you've looked in the mirror and say, I have done every single thing I know how to do to train this person. And I know it sounds simple today, but back then it was, again, one of those light bulb moments where I was like, you know what, he's right. I need to change the way that I'm training. And I've been working my whole life on perfecting ways to train my, my team, but not just train them, mentor them and communicate to them, meaning these four basic pillars. And I, I talk about it every single day to my executive team and the people, the men and women that are the GMs and the chefs, because they they're really hold all the power and all the cards in the restaurants. I can't be in 12 places at one time. So I need to train you, mentor you, teach you, coach you that this is what we want as a, as a company. And it's very, very simple. It's tell, show, practice, validate. If you do those four things yourself, not, sure. not give it off to somebody else to do, but as the person that is the whether it's the founder or the, the keeper of the keys, you know, the holder of all the information. If you do that and you do it 100%, how can we have any sort of miscommunication? Or if, they, if, they, if they're not willing to do those four things after you've shown them and you've validated that this is the way we put the cup of coffee on the plate <laughs> or on the table, and they want to go outside those guardrails, then they're not the right person for your company. And you have to let them go because it's not fair to everybody else that is doing it that way. And it also will lose the consistency, which is the number one reason restaurants are successful, I think, or any business for that matter. Consistency is everything. But yeah. you know, to go back to your original question about why did it change, it had to change. Sure. It couldn't sustain itself, this yelling, screaming, yeah. you know, and also you know, forget about you know, just court decisions and things like that, that the legalities of it. Um, it's just a different world, and people won't tolerate that. And also, I think. There's another thing that's sort of a crossroads, which is um, there was a time when I would have, like at Radius, for example, the restaurant you were starting to talk about earlier, where a lot of our awards came from, uh, I would have a stack of 20, 30, 40 people always willing to work for free or for next to nothing just for the experience. And as the restaurant population has exploded and as retail has gone uh, e-commerce, so you don't have as many bricks and mortar um, you know, retail operations, Incredible pressures put on our industry to fill all those vacancies. Uh, banks, um, coffee, um, food and beverage, and fitness. Those are the four like things that are taking up a lot of the retail space today. Um, you don't see people building Macy's anymore, or Lord and Taylor's, or things right. like that. It just doesn't happen. And so, um, as that sort of changed, the the pool of talent uh, became thinner and thinner. And so, again, we go back to. Um, things that we look at in our company, and we, uh, when we look at the characteristics of what we're looking for to hire somebody, at no point in the seven or ten key characteristics is the word experience. 
you don't have to have experience to come work with me, but you have to be happy, you have to be trustworthy, you have to have a certain amount of self-confidence, you have to be committed, dedicated. Those are the things I'm looking for. I'll teach you how to carry a tray or make a bowl of pasta. Um, but yeah, experience isn't necessarily the top thing for me anymore. How does that, you talked about the four pillars and, and kind of these teaching um, experiences. You've got 11 restaurants currently? I think something like that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You have a lot when you're not even sure. I like that. I wasn't sure, too. I was counting them. And I well, think it's, roughly it's 11 or 12. Yeah. Depends on there's this one restaurant where we split it in half. And yeah. one side's Italian. We got this little tiny restaurant that we have Japanese next to it. Now yeah. it was a pop-up space. Uh, so. how, do you, how do you apply these concepts to kind of managing all of you, you Again, you can't be in all places at once. You can't be in no. all these restaurants at once. How do you find the right people to manage these for you and kind of take some of these kind of um, cultural aspects yeah. that you talk about and, and, and sprinkle them down through the business from, so, from yeah. executives down. Yeah, right? it's a team sport. I mean, like anything, I, I, I go into, um, you know, in Boston, I would go into the Apple store, for example, and I would say, how is it that, that I'm getting the same experience at every Apple store? Sure. Or how is it that you go into a McDonald's and you get the same experience at every McDonald's? These it's are big companies. Right? The consistency. Yeah. So yeah. where is it? Like, what, what, are, what are we not doing well? And what are we doing well? So we're a big fan of something called appreciative inquiry in our company. And that is we look at what we're doing well and we try to populate more of that. It's easy to walk into a restaurant and say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, <laughs> that's wrong, and that's wrong. And that's what most managers do. So compliment sandwich is a big deal for us, you know, to say, hey, you're doing a great job. Last night went so well. We do need to do a better job on whatever it might be. And then you finish them up with another compliment. As I said, it's a team sport, so I'm not by myself here. We have a CEO, a CFO, directors of operations, and we meet on a weekly basis, number one. If we can't all be in the same room, then we do a Google chat, and Google Meet, so go Google. Go. Um, it's changing my life, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> it really has. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not technologically advanced, but Google is like changing my life. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that because I'm here. It's the truth. Uh, we have our CEO who is a huge fan of, of all the different Google products, and he has changed our company um, in a way that we're all communicating better. So communication is still, doesn't matter what business you're talking about, is the number one, whether it's business or even in your friendship or your love life, communication is always going to be the number one thing to help drive you know, goals and, and objectives. So. We, we do a couple of things. Uh, we promote from within, which is a very important thing to us. If we can't find the person from within, there's probably a chance that somehow, some way, if we're looking to the outside, that person has a connection to somebody on our executive team, often, if, if it's a top level job. So it might be, you know, hey, I'm, uh, we're looking for a new GM at a restaurant. Say, you know who's looking? I used to work with them at such and such a restaurant. Sure. I know they're yeah. really good, and I think they'd be a good fit. Um, but you know, the same could be said for the quite the opposite, where somebody says, I know so-and-so is looking, don't hire them because I know they won't be a good fit. You have to be cut from similar cloth, I think, as far as not everybody brings the same um, skill set, obviously, and not everybody has uh, necessarily uh, the same experiences or in the same place in their career. But what we hope is that you all have the same um, key ingredient to uh, being part of our company, and that is to have a predisposition to serve. And it's something we talk about endlessly in our company. Are you the type of person to hold that door open just a few extra seconds for somebody when they walk in the, into an office building? Are you the type of person to say, bless you to a stranger on the subway who's sneezed? You know, are you the type of person that says, excuse me, you drop this and you go chase after somebody because they dropped their scarf? If you're not, and you're that type of person that when the elevator door is closing and you're like in an in a office place Hit and you mud. press it to close it, I don't want you. It's lame. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't. So so I want the one that says I, I'll hold that door. We've all been in those situations, sure. and you know what you do and yeah. what you don't do. And so again, it goes back to that inner monologue of, did you, did you do the right thing? Yeah. And the same thing can be said about a, a you know a, a hard day's work. Yeah. You know if you mailed it in today or not. Did you try your hardest? Yeah. And so those are the people that we're looking for. And the, if if we can find the uh, sort of right human being and then give them the proper training and the proper guidance of what it is that we want from our company, we can have a consistent product that you can go into any restaurant in the country that we're involved in and hopefully have a similar experience. There'll always be a little difference because of location and there'll be a little difference because of a management style or what have you, but overall the, 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 the sort of heart of it needs to be the same. And I think that that's what people come to expect. That's why, we, that's why chains are, are successful, or some chains are, is that you know 
when you go into McDonald's, you are never going to get a medium rare, juicy hamburger. It's never going to happen. They all smell the same. They all look the same. Hopefully, they have salt on the french fries. I, I don't personally eat a lot of fast food. But when I go to look at these, and it's funny, I like go for research just to see, um, like, have they changed at all? And like McDonald's is, uh, use that as an example because it's the most successful you know, food company. And if you think about it, they've tried at times to convince us that somehow there's something healthy there, right? right. They're putting salads and doing this. But at the end of the day, what do people go to McDonald's for? They want a quarter pound of cheese or, sure. you don't say, oh, I'm starving, I want a salad. <laughs> go to Let's go to McDonald's. <laughs> so you might get one when you're there, yeah. but it's not the first thing. Sure. And so it's so ingrained yeah. in your head. So what we're trying to do is, is, is obviously we're not that, that sort of size, but what we're hoping to do is that our company is that when you think of our restaurants, you think of these are gonna be quality experiences I don't necessarily have to pay an arm and a leg to go to them. Uh, they're not on the super low end. They're not on the super high end. Um, I, had one, I have one restaurant that's on the higher end. But the rest of them are trying to be part of a community. Sure. And that's, that's what's interesting to me also. Yeah, absolutely. Which leads me to, why did you come to Detroit, right? <laughs> I don't even have to ask the question. Right, yeah. Just lead, lead me on. I like this. Yeah, absolutely. Please tell us why. Community. I yeah. mean, it was. It was the, the, so we built this restaurant in Birmingham called Adachi. And... Uh, it was bred from friendship. So what happened was um, one of my partners in DC, uh, we have five restaurants in Washington, DC, and one of the partners there grew up here. And uh, he had some friends visiting him, and they brought him to some of our restaurants. And um, they're developers, they're like hotel guys, and they own parking lots, and they own uh, some restaurants, but more like chain restaurants yeah. and things like that. They own gas stations. They own cell phone stores. They're, on, they're like serial entrepreneurs, these guys. And they're, but they're really nice, good guys. So they come into the restaurants, and they look, and they're like, wow, holy shit. Like, this is what we want. This is, this is exciting. This is, it was one of my restaurants called Tico. And my wife is a mixed media artist. And um, my wife, Adrian, went to Tico and did all the painting, did all the distressing of the place built these incredibly super cool like glass panels that have her artwork inside of them. And um, she did it eight months pregnant too, so I'll, I'll never forget that, and she'll never let me forget that, that she did <laughs> that work yeah. pregnant. Um, that we have pictures of her like on a ladder with the belly out to here, and she's painting and doing all this stuff. And, but when you see the restaurant, it's an exciting place. And it's because of her work that it, that it was so exciting. And when they came in to see it, they immediately said, this is something we would love to see in Detroit. Now, we didn't want to do Tico in Detroit, the developers were very specific that they wanted a Japanese-inspired restaurant. So they said to me, you've got Italian, you've got American, you've got Latin American, you've got a California restaurant. Have you ever done a Japanese restaurant? Oh, yeah, of course we've done Japanese, yeah, which I had not. <laughs> um, and, but I am of the attitude that um, I, I, I'm not a, a master of everything, but if I put my, my mind to it, my sure. heart to it, then I will, and I had, I had made food like this before, but never built a whole restaurant around it. So I had some time, and I started to work with some, some people that I really enjoyed working with, uh, and just learning some more techniques. I'd already worked with these kinds of products before, but when they said Japanese, I said, well, let's, let's call it Japanese inspired, so it gives us a little bit of room, a little, a little wiggle room. room. Sure. And uh, they allowed me to uh, help pick the designer, a woman named Molly Allen from Washington, D.C. And if you haven't been to Adachi yet, it's a real push and pull sort of experience in that you go down South Woodward in uh, Birmingham, and there's this old, beautiful Peabody Ford mansion, it's called. And it's on this corner, and you look at it, and it could have been you know, a lovely old, like, French restaurant or American sure. restaurant. The Victorian and Yeah, style. exactly. Yeah. We're, we, our office now is in Detroit, but we used to be in Birmingham, so we right. literally were two blocks from there. So, so you know we where all it know is. the mansion very well, yeah. And so you walk in today, though, and it's super cool with this m mural, and uh, I've got the music. As I said, music's important to me. I do all the music for all the restaurants. And you walk in, and you're changed with this energy that is unexpected, which is what I, which is what I like. I always like a little surprise here and there. Sure. And we have a fantastic chef that I was able to hire named Lloyd Roberts, yeah. who uh, is you know, just doing a beautiful job there and making really consistent, really good food. But when I came to visit them, uh, it was really at the first, the, when I first came here, it was really with the thought of like, I'm just going to help out these friends and give them some advice. And advice turned into, well, what, how about if you consult? And consult turned into, why don't you design? And design has now turned into, well, why don't you manage the property yeah. for us? So uh, 
the restaurant business is a tough business. It's a, it's sure. a game of inches, and um, so I'm happy to be here, and we're going to do more projects with them because we've had such a good experience so far. And the place is packed, you know, which is, you know, knock on some metally plastic thing, yeah, um, that, it's, that it's really busy. So I'm, I'm, I'm super happy with that's it. That's great. Well, congratulations, thanks. And, and thanks for, thanks for considering Michigan. Uh, the, the city of Detroit, in particular, um, has seen its ups, seen its ups and downs, mm -hmm. and food has been a huge cornerstone of a lot of the re and a lot of the reason that uh, people are moving back into the city. So it's great yeah. to have you here. Um, what have you learned uh, through the process of consulting, then now sure. managing the restaurant and, and adding it to your portfolio? What have you learned being in the city of Detroit about? kind of what's going on in Detroit. Have you found any favorite restaurants? Like yeah. what, what's your outlook now on the city of Detroit, uh, now being part of, sure. kind of the culture here? So it's a, it's a great question. And, and I would say the first thing I tell people that anybody will listen to me is that I do believe, having grown up in Brooklyn, that Detroit is the next Brooklyn. Um, I really believe that to be true. And that's not some sort of lip service, because I'm here. I believe that Detroit and Brooklyn have a certain odd synergy, and, and I can't necessarily nail what that is, but I feel it. There's this movement of, you know, young, entrepreneurial, cool ideas, uh, creative, you know, it's all based around that. But without that Manhattan skyline, you know, which when you lived in Brooklyn, Manhattan always sort of got center stage and be like, oh, you live in Brooklyn. Now it's, oh, you live in Brooklyn? That's, it's cool now, you know, right. and it was never cool back then, sure. but now it's cool. And Detroit was, I think, for I mean, candidly, obviously, for many, many years, downtrodden and had gone through such, you know, um, financial, you know, uh, issues and problems. And now you see this um, gentrification. You have beautiful, beautiful architecture here. People are taking advantage of it. The problem was the buildings were just empty and, you know, dilapidated, but now they're being brought back sure. or new buildings are being uh, done. So there's this beautiful, um, very interesting to me, um, combination of old and new here. You have a lot of chefs that are coming here, some that have Michigan roots, so like Anthony from She Wolf. I don't know if you guys have been to that restaurant before, yep. but he just came to visit me on Monday. You know, I knew him from Washington, D.C., and the fact that he comes back here and is just crushing it with beautiful Italian food and handmade pastas. And you could be in any, I think, any um, major city in the world and hope for an experience like you would get at She Wolf. Sure. And so I, the one thing that I would say that's been surprising to me is that, that when, you, when I heard about Detroit, I thought, oh, there's going to be so many people that will need jobs. And that's not really the case. The unemployment's fairly low here. Um, and so the, the restaurants are all, like in any other part of the country, struggling to fill all the positions. And, um, you know, but we've been lucky. The, the, in Birmingham, we've got a, a decent crew there that started. You have a little bit of turnover at the beginning of any restaurant, but the crew that's there today is really good. So sure. um, better and better and better. The service has been good. I've been to a bunch of places here. I, I got stuck here in a blizzard last year. That happens, yeah. Um, <laughs> just a little note, um, not speaking you know, poorly about Detroit, you can plow before the snow ends. <laughs> it's allowed. Uh, we do it in Boston all the time, and it works out really, really nicely. But apparently here, they wait till it stops snowing. They do. Yeah, but it yeah. snows a lot here, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. So it really yeah. piled up, and nobody could go anywhere. Um, so uh, I just walked everywhere that I wanted to go to. And, um, but I went to, I had great like drinks and great experience at Wright & Company, of course, yeah. uh, Apparatus Room. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember all the places that I went to, uh, but it was, it's been a great experience here. And the people are nice here, you know, everybody's, uh, I think, you know, where I grew up, there's a, just an incredible amount of sarcasm, everybody's so <laughs> sandwiched together. They're, not that they're mean, but there's, a, there's that jab all the time that's sure. going on. Your friends, your best friends are the ones that make fun of you, you know, and I, I don't sense that here the same way. You know, maybe it happens, but um, I, I certainly get the sense that people are very, very, you know, nice to each other and pleasant, and that's, it's lovely. It's, uh, it's still it's, the Midwest spirit we have. I here. think that's Absolutely. nice. I mean, yeah. we probably the East Coast could use a little bit of that every yeah. once in a while. Can Can you talk a little bit more um, about Adachi and kind of where the inspiration came from? I know that um, the proprietors mm -hmm. um, initially wanted a Japanese-inspired restaurant. Wh where did it go? How did it go from that? Just this idea. Sure to what it Adachi, is. What's, what's the name represent? What yeah. type of food did you decide to bring into that restaurant? So one of the partners, a guy named Ken Koza, and Kenny is uh, just a great guy who just wants to take care of everybody. He owns you know, all this stuff, and he's in part of a family business. And, but he singularly 
uh, just said, I, I really, for personal reasons, want a Japanese-inspired restaurant. He had lived in Japan for a little while, okay. um, and he was enamored by the uh, Adachi Gardens there, but also Adachi's a, a fairly common last name, and he stayed with his family for a little while that their last name was Adachi as well. And he liked the sound of it, and he, there's, so there's, the, there's a museum there, there's the Adachi Gardens, and he just, it was a name he had always had. And so when he came to me, he said, can you, can you do this? So I said, I can do this, but if I'm not going to move to you know, the Detroit area, we need to have a, a killer chef. You know, we we sure. need somebody that really can understand what I'm going to tell them food-wise and then uh, execute it on a daily basis. So I started to do a search for, um, for uh, staff, but specifically for my, my chef. And I wasn't getting the responses that I had hoped for. And I, quite frankly, was like, I am fucked. You know, I'm sorry for my language, but I am totally screwed here. And um, I don't know how I'm going to pull this off because if I don't have the right chef, I can't move there. And what am I going to do? Because my name's on the door. I have to have the right person. Right. And so this resume comes in from Indeed. And I think somebody's pulling my leg. I think it's a joke. Right. And I, I read it, and it comes from Dubai. It's like, Somebody in Dubai is applying for a job in Birmingham? This is, this, somebody's messing with me. And I look a little further, and I say to my assistant, you got to set me up with a Skype call for this. So just email this person first, see if they're really interested. And uh, on the resume was New York City, uh, some of my favorite restaurants, Jean Georges, uh, The Modern with Gabriel Kunther when he was the chef there, Nobu went downtown, then Nobu 57. And then it says this person, his name's Lloyd Roberts, is. Um, has moved from uh, Nobu 57 and is going as the executive chef of Nobu Budapest, then Nobu Moscow, and then goes to Dubai to become the executive chef of Wakami in Dubai. And I just think it's a total, you know, somebody's playing with me. Uh, so then I, um, we set up a Skype call. And now I'm really convinced that somebody is playing with me because on my uh, <laughs> Skype call is this uh, large, uh, African-American man who was born in Jamaica. And I'm like, OK, who, who are you? He's like, I'm, he's like, I'm Lloyd Roberts. And I was like, all right, let's start talking. And I immediately fall in love with the guy. He's so sweet, so nice, but super talented. And we start talking about food. And he, he understands everything I say. Like, that doesn't happen every time. You know, sometimes I'll break something up, and somebody's like, I, you know, I don't, I don't know about that. Or he knew everything. And we had sort of similar parallel lines in New York. And uh, I said, well, I can't fly to Dubai to taste your food. You know, and, and do you, you want to move back to the States? He has two kids, and he met his wife uh, in Russia, I believe, or maybe when he was in England. I can't remember where they met. But uh, he said, we want to come back to the States, but I don't want to work in New York, San Francisco, Chicago. I don't want to be in a big city. I said, oh, have I got the place for you? I said, this is going to be great. I've got this great town for you to, where you could bring your kids up. Your kids can run around. And you're going to love it. And I convinced him to look this place up and talk to people. And he moved. I hired him without tasting his food. And he moved here without ever seeing Birmingham. Really? Wow. Which is crazy, right? And so he gets here. And the restaurant's delayed a little bit. So I bring him to Washington, DC. And we start to do pop-ups in my restaurants to promote Adachi. And they sell out you know, one after another after another. And I, we just. There was a, a, an immediate synergy and understanding as soon as we got together. And uh, I'm so proud of him. Today, there was this beautiful review that we got in, in one of the local papers. And you know, when we saw each other, they would just you know, hug each other and <laughs> were like, so proud of what they're doing. And he, you know, he, he was working in all these major cities. And he said, oh, and he's got this great accent. It's like a little bit of Jamaica, a little bit of New York City, a little bit of London, and then something else that I can't figure out what it is. But it's all mixed together. And when, he saw, when, when I talk to him on the phone sometimes, he say, oh, chef. And I could hear, he sh I, even though we're on the phone, I know he's shaking. He goes, I'm not in New York anymore, am I? I said, no, you're not. You have to, you have to treat. And every place is different. And everybody eats differently, funny sure. enough. You know, that's yep. another thing that's sort of worth talking about. That the, the, I could put the most popular dish on, say, Alta Strada, one of our Italian restaurants, uh, on every menu. And it won't necessarily become the most popular dish in other restaurants. Sure. And I find that sort of fascinating. Like what sells in Washington, DC may not sell in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Uh, and it may not sell in LA. But what sells in LA won't necessarily sell in the other places also. So it's, uh, that's sort of fascinating to watch how people eat and how they behave. Um, obviously, the people here are the best behaved people. You know, <laughs>
Couldn't agree more. Yes. Well, thank you for all of that information. And yes, uh, the reviews have been awesome on Adachi. Thank you again for, for considering Detroit. Except for, can I ask you, Google doesn't, they don't own Yelp, do they? No, we don't. Okay, good. I was going to get um, there, too. Let's so. do, let's talk about Yelp. Talk, you let's you talk talked a little Yelp. bit about, so you, you gave a glowing review of Google technology helping mm -hmm. you and, and your staff. So thank you for that. I'll slip you the 50 five. bucks. I owe you I only need five. It's fine. Five, okay. Five's fine. Yeah. Normally, I get 50. Oh, so that's 50 is good, though. Okay. Now, five. We okay. get it on film. Okay. Um, but thank you for that. And, and you know, we obviously try and make people's lives easier through some sure. of the technology that we have. And technology in general is, uh, I guess, supposed to do that. But when we have chefs and restaurateurs in, um, we always get into this conversation. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with the positives of technology with also some of the challenges that um, uh, reservation apps and food delivery services now. The folks aren't even going out as much anymore because they're just having food yeah. delivered to them. So wh what's the balance that you find between the positives that you have with also sure. some of the challenges that you also have to consider now that maybe you didn't have to consider 20 years ago? You didn't have to consider those things, right? You, I mean, takeout was you called up and said, I'll have, you know, a quart of hot and sour soup, and That's you went it. and got it, and That's that it. was the end yeah. of it, right? <laughs> so um, all of this is an ever-changing world, and we have a few people on our team that specialize in this, and so they stay current on this. There's a couple of things that the, the end result user, the, the guest, probably doesn't even know. Like when you call, for example, Uber Eats or Caviar, the rev share on that, as an example, is not a good model for the restaurateur. We're already dealing with really slim margins. Yeah. And so when Uber Eats, for example, or somebody like that, a company like that, I don't need to name them specifically, but they're very popular. A, I can't control the product. I don't know, if you're the Uber driver and you come and pick that up, I don't know how long you are leaving that, say, sushi in the backseat of your car before you bring it over to the person that ordered it. Sure. So I can't control the product once it leaves, but I also, the rev share is a percentage that I don't really understand the, the model. When, when you think about Uber as an example, which I use all the time and I love the product, the product is, I'm charged based on how far I go. Right? right? So uh, you get in the car, you're going this far, it's $10. You go that far, it's $20, and you go that much further, it's $30, right? But for Uber Eats, they charge me based on how much you order, not how far they have to drive it. So if you're just going across the street and you order $200 worth of food, right. I have to give them $60, yes. 30%. Right. If you order $10 worth of food and you're going you know, 10 blocks, I only have to give them $3. Right. Yep. It, that part doesn't make any sense sure. to me. So yep. if you're watching Uber Eats, let's, let's work on that. <laughs> um, we could work on that one. The um, systems, though, of, of, of making sure that you are um, technologically easy for the, is also very important. So making sure like all the apps that we have, the online ordering apps, are super fast and super easy and not too complicated, I think sure. is a big play. Because I know what I'm doing it for, you know, if I'm going to order something for my wife and kids online, um, and I don't shop like from clothes online or things like that. My wife does, but I don't. I still go to a store and I want to, you know, uh, touch the pants or whatever it is and feel them and try stuff on. And because I'm too lazy, I don't want to send it back if it doesn't fit. <laughs> it's too much just, work. Yeah, just don't, just don't take it out of the store, you know, <laughs> right. and then you don't have to bring it back. Um, but for food, which you can't return, um, I want to make sure that it's super easy for people and so that uh, if they are doing it. But I always, I mean, if we can, if they want delivery, they want delivery. And, you, you know, there's that ease. But part of the beauty of a restaurant is that interaction, that social interaction, that yeah. even if it's just with the bartender or the waiter or somebody, and you're not eating you know, in your house, over your computer, watching TV, whatever it is, there's times for that, of course. Yeah. But I also think that one of the things that we provide is, is that social interaction that makes it so, yeah, so yeah. makes it so interesting. The, the part about like, um, you know, reviews, when I, was a, when I was a young cook and when I started in the business and even, you know, uh, as my career, you know, uh, sort of kept going, there were certainly plenty of times where I thought, okay, there's a, there's a food critic, and you have to take care of that food critic because that food critic yielded incredible power. And so if in the New York Times, if Ruth Reichel or I'm going way back, Brian Miller, whoever it might have been, wrote a good review, that restaurant was busy for years sure. off of that good review. The reality is that you all have the power of the pen now. It's yeah. different. So you go on Yelp and say, this place sucked. I'm never going back there. My, my food, I, I, it didn't come out for seven minutes. <laughs> my first thing is I'm thinking like, all right, well, what could you make at home in seven minutes You know that you're getting mad at me for? But we have a certain expectation when we go out to dinner that the food's going to be delivered in a prompt, reasonable amount of time. 
And what I would say to anybody who's going to write a review online is did you give the operator the opportunity to fix whatever the issues are? Now, if, the, now if nobody ever came over and said, hi, I just I want to come over and check and see, I hope you enjoyed your meal. We've all done this before. I've done it for sure. And that is, how's everything? It's good. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah, everything's great. Thanks. And, yeah, and then, you go, then you walk out and you're like, well, that sucked. I'm never going back there again. Give the person a chance to sure. fix it. So um, some of my favorite Yelp or Google reviews are the ones where somebody said, you know, we had an issue with blank, but the manager came over, the chef came over, and they fixed it. Yeah, sure. That's the opportunity to really win over a guest for a long period of time uh, is when you have those opportunities presented to themselves. Did you act on it? And, uh, but everybody's a critic now. And they always were. They just have way more power. Yeah. And, but, I, but when somebody says, like, I'm going to go online and write a review and I'm going to ruin you, it's like, OK, it's, it's food. You know, yeah. We're just trying. It's a human business. There's going to be error. And at times, we try to minimize those errors. But when there is an error, we make sure that we go above and beyond anything that we could do uh, normally to make sure you had a good experience. And in reverse, when somebody writes something glowing and something really nice, we make sure we reach out as well and thank say, hey, you. thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoyed sure. it. Please say hello next time you're in. And uh, again, it's, a, it's about connection sure. more than anything else. Reviews aside, because there's, there is some, other than the participation you just mentioned, there is some lack of control there, um, which is what they're meant to be, I suppose, mm -hmm. from, from the ground up. When we go back to some of the other technology, like the reservation systems, like the food delivery, sure. we've talked to some chefs, and we've, I've read a few articles where some newer restaurants are actually shying away from that. So they're not participating in technology from a reservation perspective. Yeah. You have to actually pick up the phone and call the restaurant. Yeah. And they're not participating in delivery because whether it's issues with rev share or just losing control of the yeah. food between pickup and delivery to the to the, the person who's ordered it. Have you ever thought about something like that? Or we is have. it too important to the no, community to, no. to kind of we, stay involved in that? We, the, you know, especially with the reservation system, it is an ongoing conversation, an ongoing, you know, like battle, basically. Sure. You, have a, uh, you have one, you know, 800 pound gorilla in open table. Sure. And there's almost this threat that you feel, not by them, as an operator, you feel this, this pressure I sort of have to go with them, right? Because what if, I, if you're scrolling and you're in a new city and you're looking at open table for, for restaurants in my area where I want Italian food and you're scrolling and scrolling and we're not on open table, does that mean you're never going to find us? How are you going to find us? And so there's that fear. Well, open table, if you, um, which is a great system, it's, it's, it, it provides a service for sure, but there's a cost to us as well. Not just, and it's not as simple as just one size sort of fits all. Yeah. If you, Make the reservation on Open Table through my website, the restaurant's website. It costs twenty-five cents per guest. If you make it through Open Table, it's one dollar per mm -hmm. guest. So I'm not sure why, but it is. And so when you see the checks that I write to Open Table every single month, you start to scratch your head and say, "Is this worth it?" Because it's a lot of money. Yeah. But they provide a service and they provide information to you. And like, so I could find out, you know, oh, Jason ate in this restaurant. 400 times. It's time we bought Jason a meal, you know, or here, or it's his birthday, or they give you a lot of good information. information so data. you're paying for that too. Um, so it, it is, um, there's a couple of other systems out there that, that are interesting and they're a little bit more cost effective, but they're not as big. And so you don't have some of the bandwidth that they have, that, that Open Table has. But it's an interesting conversation and I'm, I'm not sure where it will ultimately go. Yep. For us right now, we have Open Table. Um, in our restaurants. Uh, now, the funny thing is at Adachi, we don't. But Adachi is really small. It's 65 seats. And um, we only have half, we leave half the, rest of re half of the restaurant for reservations and half for walk in So going back to community, I want you to feel like you can walk in at any time and hopefully get a table. Luckily, it's been really busy. So the first people that walk in get the table, and then everybody else has to wait a little bit. But it's a, it seems like it's a fair way to do it, that half the restaurant's for reservation and half is not. It's finding a balance, right? I'm I trying to. You know, at, the, at the end of the day, listen, I have a financial you know, fiduciary responsibility to the investors, to the business itself, to make sure that we're making as much money as possible. But you have a responsibility to your guests to provide a really enjoyable experience and not just think, you don't want your guests to ever think it's just about the money. Like when you come and see the fish that we have there, it's, they're, it's pristine, it's perfect. It's, it's as good a fish as I could possibly get. And uh, it's been one of the, the overriding comments, which I'm really happy about. So you know, if you like sushi and sashimi, you come there. And the, the first thing I've heard um, over and over and over again is, where are you getting this from? Because this is really spectacular fish. So that makes us feel good that 
the guest is recognizing the quality of the product. Um, and you know, over a course of time, if you can continue to do that, you'll build up a loyal base. Right. I want to go back to something because I'd, I'd be remiss not to touch on mm -hmm. this. I, I let it go by earlier, but I, I've been thinking about coming back to it. And, and I'm using technology as a bridge because sure. we talked about technology just now. You've done some YouTube videos, some how-tos, things like that, which yeah. are really fun. Um, and you also have a great website, truly. Um, and I found some really interesting stuff on your website that you touched on earlier. You talked about how much you enjoy music mm -hmm. and travel. You've got two sections on your website. One is for travel recommendations. So let's say you go to Portland. Here's yeah. a bunch of places that you recommend, right? I I, I'm really doing cool. a terrible job yeah. of keeping up with it, to yeah. be honest with you. Though. Yeah. I love what's on there. I, this I, is the reminder. I, well, okay. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get a on Detroit the, one. Yeah, OK, for sure. I'll definitely yeah. get a Detroit All one. Right. I suck at keeping up on it. And, and uh, we're redoing my website. Keeping the same ideas, but just yeah. but revamping the look of it. Great. Because, thank you for your your compliments. But it needs to. I think it needs to look a little different, and we haven't kept up with it. Sure. So music, like I have this thing, yeah. music to cook with. Like, download this stuff, and you turn the music. That's on. That's where I was going. That's yeah. my favorite okay. section. I I, I love to cook uh, with my wife, and we always throw music on while we're doing so. And I followed some years, and they're oh, quite cool. good. They Thanks. really are. I need to update that too because yeah. there's a lot of music. I mean, some of it's older music, and some of it's newer. Yeah. But um, one of the things I, I wrote a book uh, years ago called "It's About Time," and um, the book is uh, it's, the subtitle is uh, "Recipes for Everyday Life." And and what uh, what the book was about was that I realized, and we could talk about technology and, and you know fold this into the conversation is that I was doing some research for the book. I didn't want to write a book that was about you know, appetizer, soup, salad, entree, or the seasons, or about me. I mean, I had to put me in it, but <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't going to be this egotistical chef's you know, tome with, that was going to sit on your coffee table and nobody's ever going to cook from it. I wanted something that you were going to use. And so um, at the time, I wasn't married. And I was watching my sister, who has a bunch of kids. And she was like literally running a mini restaurant in her house. And she's like, Zachary, what do you want for dinner? Joshua, what do you have? I was like, what is this? A, you know, what are you, a short order cook? And like, what are you doing? When we were kids, there was one meal uh, that everybody had. And there was no ordering. The only ordering was on your birthday. And that's where you ordered something that your brothers and sisters didn't like so that you could torture them a little bit, right? <laughs> and so I started to come up with this notion of time is the most precious commodity we have. Nobody has enough of it. And we're all trying to make more of it. And food other than for just basic you know, sustenance, is the center of our day. You know, it's, it's things happen around the table. Yep. And whether it's the morning coffee table, it's the dinner table, like you know, for my family, 6.30, quarter to 7, your ass was in that seat, and you better be ready, because dinner's coming, and everybody had to be. And, that's, and, and there was no getting up early or anything. That's where we learned about you know, how to behave and how to talk about politics. Sure. And you know, just in general, it was at my parents' kitchen table. And we don't have that anymore. You know, it's sort of gone from everyday life. It's a rare treat. And so I thought, why not write a book that it, the chapters be broken into what's happening to you today? What do you need today from food? And so it's everything from a chapter on speed, uh, and getting food on the table in 30 minutes or less, to all the way through where it's time to celebrate and relax and turn off your phone and turn off your computer and turn on the music and open up a bottle of wine and cook for the basic tactile pleasure, the, the smells. Everybody's got that, that certain thing that takes you back to either grandma's house or your mother's house. And you're like, ah, oh, the smell of a roasted lemon garlic chicken makes me think of you know, my grandmother's house. And so when I was doing this, um, when I was doing this book, I, I was looking up things that I could find that maybe I could throw into the book that were you know, different um, pieces that were written a long time ago. And I didn't include this in the book, but I always talk about it. There was, this, there was this article that was like from the late 50s or early 60s, sort of a Jules Verne kind of thing that said, by the year 2000, you know, by the year 2000, automation and technology will do everything for us that the average American will only have to work 20 hours a week. And I thought, well, that would have been great. You know, it's quite the opposite. About 4x that, right? Well, now, that, yeah. but that is because I think the one part about technology is we continue to use it to become more productive. Yeah. And so we're never turned off anymore. You know, sure. when our parents were off for the weekends, they were off. You know, and when, when my father came home from work and the phone rang and we were at the dinner table, my father would pick up and say, Michael's having dinner right now, call back at 7 30 and yep. hang up sure. on my friends. Sometimes sure. he didn't even say goodbye, you know, yeah. just hang up on them. And that's just different. Like the phone rings, and you know, me or my wife, or you know, we're always, oh, sorry, I'll be right back. I got to take this. Yeah. You don't really have to take it, but we're like Pavlov's dog. The thing buzzes in our pocket, and we're like, ah, I got to answer it. I got to answer it. And I'm not sure why. 
we did that to ourselves. And what we've done is the technology is great because we are more productive, we get more stuff done, but we're never stopping. And it's hard to turn your brain off now. Sure. So we it's, say it's a balance, good. right? Well, you, you need it, and I don't have it. I yeah. mean, I, I, most I, of us don't. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have it. But, but at the same token, I, but I'm happy. You know, I mean, sure. I, I, yeah. I, I love the feeling of getting stuff done and, and all of the different things that I use for keeping track. Um, you know, when you check something off, there's a sense of accomplishment. The list is long, but every time you can say, oh, I just got six things done. You know, I'm in the car, what am I doing? I'm working, I'm in the car, we're not, we're not relaxing, sure. I'm not taking a nap, yeah, you know, I'm getting saying. stuff done. I love your idea, um, you know, from the cookbook and also just kind of in general, the idea of food being a staple of the day and bringing things together, bringing people together. Mm -hmm. um, food is huge at Google, right? Yeah, everyone, when the first, First question I always get when people find out I work at Google, oh, you know, you guys get free food? Yeah. We do, and, and it's amazing. Right. Uh, shout out to our team. Um, one of the reasons that that was done from very odd, very early on, though, is as a part of the day to bring people together, especially in today's day and yeah. age where you're working 80 hours a week, it's so easy just to bring a sandwich, sit at your desk, and keep working. Yeah. Whereas if you've got delicious food just down the hall and you could smell it wafting yeah. through the, the uh, through the hallways, it's much easier for me to grab a couple of my teammates and say, hey, let's go have a lunch meeting. Let's sit there for yeah. an hour. Let's actually just enjoy the food and, and talk and catch up. And some of Google's best ideas have come about over lunch meetings that maybe you wouldn't have had That's if you great. didn't have that food. So there is, it is a fantastic perk, and we're very lucky to have it, but there's also some meaning behind it as well. I think it's great. We enjoy. Yeah, I mean, I'm in the food business, so I wish you came to our restaurants instead of staying here for your lunch meetings, but I'm teasing you. I think it's very cool that Google can you, provides can you, you said 65 seats in Adachi. We've got about yeah, roughly about 65 Googlers so, in this office. Well, we what we should do we'll is one, up for lunch. why don't we do one day? Why don't I come here and cook you all lunch one day? Why don't we do that? You guys in? Yeah. That, I would <laughs> love perfect. to do that. That's easy. Um, we would come never here say no. Yeah, yeah no, right, I mean, perfect. I did that. It's funny. You, you had mentioned Condon S. And uh, way back when, I used to go once in a while, and I, they had this, like, chef for the day kind of thing in Condon S. And I would go there and cook something for them. And that was, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. So it was, it was kind of crazy. But 65 people, we could come and Handle that, have right? some fun. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> I'd be happy to do that. Awesome. That'd be fun. We'll, but, we'll but take food, you up on that. But food is the, it's the connector. And, you know, I feel bad for people that don't like food. You know, when people say, like, yeah, it's not my thing. You know, I, I eat. I like to just, but again, just to fill their belly. Like, I'm into it. Like, I, I dream about it. I think about it. Yeah. When, I'm, when I'm planning my travels, yeah. it's all about food. <laughs> and my wife, right. my wife likes food. My kids like food. But, I mean, I'm obsessed. Yeah. So it's, it, yeah, it's not probably healthy to the point that I'm obsessed about it. But um, I used to, I, I haven't been able to keep up with it. There's, you talk about technology, but there's been some changes in like traditional um, periodicals that we've lost, unfortunately, over the course of time because of technology. And so you no longer in your restaurants get, like there was a magazine called Food Arts. And when the Food Arts would come, everybody would fight over who got to read it first. Because it also kept you up to date on who was moving, who was changing, who was going where, who was making the latest and greatest things. And I would play a game with myself to say, I am going to know where every chef that's in Food Arts is headed to. I'm doing this thing. Um, in San Diego in the next month. And it's the San Diego Food and Wine Festival. And I'm part of this like week-long celebration of different things. So there were all these names that got sent to me as to who the participating chefs were. And I sent to my uh, assistant, I said, I only know three of these names. And that was upsetting to me that I didn't know who these people were. And so I said to my assistant, here's what I want you to do. I want you to Google every single one of them and send me a little you know, report. Not, not long, just a couple sentences, so I can look at, know where they came from, where they work, and who they are, so that I don't look like, like that I'm, A, that I'm ignorant when I walk in there to say, oh, hi, where are you from? And instead, how nice is it to be able to be recognized by a peer, in this case me, that I know what you're doing, I yep. know what you're up to. Um, it always made me feel good when I was a young cook, um, a young chef, to go to these events, and somebody said, oh, uh, Michael, yes, uh, you know, Cafe Louis, Boston, uh, I just read about you. I, I, I've been dying to come try your restaurant or whatever yeah, it is. Sure. It makes you feel good. The peer-to-peer the, the -peer thing is really important in our industry. Um, not just being recognized, because you don't have to be recognized, but any man or woman that is willing to put on the white jacket and cook and sit over a hot stove, you know, 80 hours a week, there's a fraternity, a club, whatever you want to call it, that you immediately belong to. And it's a lovely thing to be able to go anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world, for that matter, and say, yeah, I'm a chef. They don't have to know the restaurant. Immediately, 
a little something extra comes out. There's that professional courtesy. It's beautiful. I was in, I was in Italy last year. I was in this little tiny town, and there was a woman running around this restaurant by herself. She didn't have any help. And I speak enough Italian that I was talking to her, and she's running around. I'd ordered a bottle of wine with the people that I was sitting with, and I knew she was too busy to even open the bottle of wine because she was by herself. And I said to her, you know, here, I'll help you. Give me the bottle of wine. I'll open it for myself. She's like, no, no, no. I said, it's okay. Go do your thing. So when it, the night cleared out and we were by ourselves, basically, me, my colleagues that I was traveling with, and the woman, so she says, she didn't speak any English, and she's like, where are you from? And you know, I told her the United States, and I'm in the restaurant business. And she's like, oh, that's why you opened the wine for me. You know that I was in the weeds, you know, which is the term. And next thing I know, her dad comes out of the kitchen, his old man. And I said, oh, can we go back in the kitchen? And I'm looking. I'm like, where? And the food was delicious. I'm like, where's your, where's your cooks? Where's your dude? Oh, no, it's just me and my daughter. And the two of them ran this restaurant. And they did 16 tables every single night. Now, 16 tables, I would never allow one server to have 16 tables. But they got away with it somehow. And the food was delicious. And yeah. everybody loved it. But that connection immediately, like, oh, you're in the restaurant business? I get and you. It's all, that part's <laughs> really great. I love that part. You had mentioned music uh, and getting to meet some of your, your idols, as too, the rock stars, things like that. Any, any as a last question, I guess, any rock star moments and in, in doing some travel with some of these folks or anything that you can share with us? Yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> I'd be gloating. Uh, I, I don't want to make you, um, well, it's weird because these people become friends. Yeah, sure. So when you say their names, you're like, you're friends with them? Um, it's weird because when I see them on stage, they're my friends doing what they do for a living, just like when I think they come see me cook. Same, yeah. I'm just cooking. Yeah. So uh, some of my highlights, uh, there's a lot of them, but uh, great moments would be traveling through Italy with REM. Uh, they're dear friends of mine, so getting to see Michael Stipe and Mike Mills and Peter Buck and traveling literally from Venice all the way down to Naples for a couple of weeks with them, that was cool. Uh, when I lived in New York, and he, we're still dear friends with Billy Joel, uh, and you know, you get a shout out when he says like, this is for Michael, scenes from an Italian restaurant, he sings and you're like, what just happened to me? Like, is that, yeah, it's like Michael who, you know? And, uh, but I've gotten to meet uh, all of my sort of rock heroes and become friendly with them, friends with like the guys from U2 and the Stones and, you know. These are not small rock bands you're talking no, about. No, 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 yeah. they're big ones, yeah. yeah, they're big ones. And it's all through food though, that's yeah. how we met, was through food. Yeah. And they would joke and say, listen, there were times in our lives where we would sing for our suppers. The way, and they all, all the rockers sure. say the same thing, sing for their supper. It's just, I guess, a line. Maybe that's the connection. And, w working at bars, you sing for your drinks and suppers back yeah, in the day, and yeah. it was always a special part I think of it. so. And you know, um, so I, I've gotten to meet all of them and become friends with them. And you know, so there's times where we won't see each other for a year or two, but if they're either blown through town or I'm somewhere where they might be, I'll go see them. And, and you know, I often would bring food backstage for after the show, or if they were staying in a hotel or something, we'd go cook at that hotel. Like maybe, that that's, really maybe that's the key. If we if we put Chef Schlau on yeah. the on the list, we'll give him free tickets. He'll bring food for us. It's so basically that's what yeah. it was. So well, <laughs> the story, wins. well, there's one story where I was uh, I, I was only like 24, 25 years old. And Billy, I was living out in uh, East Hampton, Long Island, which is where Billy Joel uh, lived. And he called me up one day, and he was out on the road. And uh, he, he, he would go to this restaurant that I was the chef at three times a week, especially in the off season. He'd go three times a week. And um, he said, hey, you know, we had become a little friendly at that point, but not like friends' friends. We just knew each other fairly well, but not, nothing crazy. And he calls up one day, and, uh, and I thought he was home and wanted something special. But so the kitchen phone rings, and they said, hey, Michael, Billy Joel's on the phone for you. I'm like, sure he is. You know, I was like, no, he's not. I was yeah. like, I, it's the phone, and there's voices on He's like, hey, Michael, it's Billy Joel. I'm like, oh my god, it really is Billy Joel. I was like, hey, um, uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, what can I do for you? Sure. What's up? And he said, um, well, I'm wondering. He goes, we're out on the road. And to be honest with you, we don't get fed very well. Like, so a, a big star like that, you know, when you go backstage, they, they, he would never eat before a show. And um, they didn't have a, a lot of like, they had catering and everything, but he didn't want to eat that. And when you get done with the show, um, especially when they were all earlier on in their careers and they would play longer like encores and things like that, everything's closed. So you're stuck with room service in a, in a hotel. You get back to the room at you know, 11.30 at night. So he said, uh, do you have a day off next week? And I said, yeah, I think I'm off Tuesday and Wednesday. Why? He said, I hear him like muffle the phone. Hey, Max, where are we next Tuesday and Wednesday? <laughs> 
And uh, it was like Albany or Buffalo or something like that. It was Albany, in fact, the first time I ever did this. And he said, would you consider coming to our show, you know, come see the show and everything, but, but we could cook dinner afterwards. <laughs> I was like, of course I would do that. That'd be, that'd be amazing, that's right? So cool. So I flew to Albany with all like 300 pounds of food or something. Yeah. And uh, I was a kid, as I said, I'm by myself. And this is before technology, so I can't record it. I don't have a cell phone back yeah. then. There's no cell phones. And um, I'm sitting up on the riser where the um, soundboard is and the lighting board and everything. And I'm sitting up there, minding my own business. And the guys are like, do you, do, would you like a beer or something to drink? I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go get a beer. Like, no, no, we'll have it brought to you. And I'm thinking I'm going to get like a bad stadium beer, you know? And this metal tub comes down with all these cold beers. And I was like, this is nice up here. And I have a beer. And he starts to play. And halfway through the show, he literally, I'll never forget this for the rest of my life. He's asked the audience, did everybody have a nice dinner tonight? And um, they cheered for whatever reason. He said, oh, he said, well, I never eat before a show. And he's like just playing on the keys and he's fooling around and, and I have no idea what he's gonna do. And he said, if you ever get to Long Island, he goes, that's where I live. He said, my friend Michael's here today. And I'm like, and I'm, I still don't think it's me. <laughs> and um, he said, he is the chef at my favorite restaurant called Supporte de Mari. And uh, we're going to have it all. And he starts to list all the things that I brought. He starts telling people, we're going to have spaghetti ali olio con bombador. We're going to have broccoli rabe. We're going to have all this stuff. He starts to like, literally list the, the menu that I brought. And he's like, I, I can't wait. So Michael, thanks for coming. And then he plays scenes from an Italian restaurant. I'm like, there's nobody here to validate this and verify that this actually happened. Nobody's going to believe me. You know? And then years later, he would play. And, I would always get like a nice little shout out or something. My, then I did have a cell phone in my cell phone, just like, <laughs> did you just get a, a shout out at you know, Gillette Stadium? You know? um, so that to me, uh, and you could hear it in my voice hopefully, is that like, one of the great pleasures is getting to meet my musical heroes, becoming friendly with them, and getting to feed them. And, and there's something Incredible. amazing about that because I, I'm in awe of musicians. I, I don't play a, an instrument, and, but I, I, I love music so much, and I'm constantly listening to music, surrounded by it, thinking about how it interacts with your experience in the restaurants. I think the restaurants are absolutely a, a five sense experience. It's not just what you eat, but it is what you see, what you hear, sure. what you smell, what you, what you put your hands on, everything like that. And so for me to be able to meet them and then play some of their music once in a while when it's appropriate in, in our different restaurants, there's a, there's a pride there that's yeah. uh, sort of difficult to explain sometimes. But um, that is a very, very cool part of awesome. what I've been able to do. Well, they say music is a great connector. Food is a great connector. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like they go hand in hand very well together. I do too. You know, I have a friend of mine um, who, you know, we were talking about different rock stars, uh, but a guy named Peter Wolf, who is the lead of singer of the Jay Giles Band, is a dear friend of mine, and he lives in Boston. And he really, it's a, a, you know, he's also sort of mixed media. He's a, he's a painter also. He's a, he's a poet. He does all sorts of things. Really interesting guy. And he's, he's one of those people that, really understands about food and people and connecting them and trying to do it also through music, but also just relationships. You, sure. you know, listen, every business, uh, doesn't matter if it's Google, restaurants, the music business, every business has really wonderful people in it and every business has some assholes in it, right? right so right, the yeah. trick is to weed out the assholes and, uh, and, and make sure you're dealing with the best Words people around. Right. Yeah, <laughs> weed out the assholes. If there's one thing that I'm gonna leave with, weed out the assholes. We can title the talk that actually. Yeah, weed right <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, well, Chef, thank you so much for coming. I could it's talk about pleasure. this forever, literally. Yeah. Um, maybe we can share some time afterwards sure. or uh, there's Whatever no question. We will bring. Uh, we will take you up on the opportunity to have you come yeah. and join and us. And if anybody has trip. questions, I'm, yeah. I, I don't have to be anywhere for a few minutes. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much yeah. for coming, and we really My appreciate pleasure. it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.